Hello, I'm Sandra Patel Stewart, CEO of Transition Partners. And I'm Ellie Nettleton, Managing Director. Welcome back to our Let's Talk Leadership podcast, The Culture Edit. This season, we're super excited. We're going to be focusing on how leaders embed a positive organisational culture. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Let's Talk Leadership podcast, the Culture Edit. So we're really excited this evening because we've actually got a live event in our Leeds office. And both myself and Sandra are really pleased to be welcome, uh, welcoming a lovely bunch of guests this evening. So I'll let them introduce themselves. I'm going to get into a 60 second elevator pitch style introduction. We've got Mike, Natasha, Fakan and Paul with us this evening. So Fakan, I'm going to get you to kick us off if that's okay. You can tell us who you are, what business you've arrived from and a bit of background about yourself. Sure, so my name is Phil Khan, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Connectin. We're based in Hull and in the South. We build smart connected cities. Um, we're about 150 people now and have raised around 150 million today. Um, business is growing fast um, and it's something that I started while I was at uni. So I have no business qualification. My background, as we were discussing earlier, is in medicine. I actually trained as a doctor and practiced as a surgeon and started this on the side. I started losing my hair and I was like, oh, <laughs> something needs to give, right? And then uh, I took a couple of years out of medicine and uh, business just kind of started off with it. Um, so having lots of fun doing it and thanks for having me, guys. Thank you. Natasha. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Natasha Sesalem. I'm the Global Head of Partner Engineering for Amazon Prime Video. Uh, I've been at Amazon for about a year and a half and before that I was at Sky and before that I was at the BBC. I'm a very proud Yorkshire woman, um, <laughs> live here in the city. Um, I'm also the founder of Empowering Women with Tech, uh, which I'll talk to you a little bit more about later, and Leeds Digital, which is the largest Twitter community, bringing all of the Leeds Digital community together. I am a proud mum of two girls, and I'm sadly an Everton supporter. I'm getting very worried that they're going to get relegated. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not the only one worrying. <laughs> Thanks for having me here. Yeah, thank you. Mike. Um, hi everyone, my name is Mike O'Brien. I'm a co-founder and uh, now co-chair of Opencast Software. Um, we're an enterprise consultancy, I think that's the best way of describing what we do. Build software and do consulting gigs for huge global enterprises. Um, a lot of the UK government as well, so we've worked with like HMRC, DWP, the NHS, worked with Barclays, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan. So quite interesting split between government and investment banking, which has its challenges. <laughs> um, we're about 305 people at the moment, offices in Newcastle, Leeds, which is just open three weeks ago, um, Edinburgh and London. Um, I started my career as a software developer in the 1980s on huge machines the size of this building. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been a sort of dying world developer all my life and um, got a chance to start a business um, after the last company I worked for was acquired. And I was cast into the world of global consulting and ran away and started a business <laughs> instead <laughs> to maybe set the world to right. So yeah, that's, that's my story and thanks very much for inviting us. Yeah, it's thanks great. for coming. Paul. Hey, um, so I'm uh, Paul Trotter. I'm the Deputy CTO at Atom Bank. I'm also the Head of Delivery Bank. Um, so I've been at Atom Bank pretty <coughs> much since it started in different forms. Uh, so I've been there since 2015. Uh, initially, I was a program director for a third party that provided a lot of the, uh, the, the software, the, the data center and everything else. So, uh, so I implemented the initial bank for them, uh, working with them closely. And then I joined them directly, uh, mainly because I liked it. <laughs> Simple as that. <laughs> and then I, so then I became uh, head of infrastructure, then took on uh, change and testing, then took on service. Uh, so I was keeping a hold of change. And then recently, um, I've got the code about last year. I've become the IT delivery head uh, of IT delivery. Uh, in terms of me, prior to that, I was consulting largely uh, for many years. Um, in terms of me as a person, uh, as a real person, uh, we are. Uh, so I've got wife, two kids, two dogs, and currently I've got uh, two Ukrainians. That's oh, it. Hi. Oh, hi. Oh, hi. Fantastic. And thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you. So um, I must say, I'm really impressed with the, the 60 seconds. Um, so yeah. we've, we've got a vast amount of experience here. Um, you guys did really well. Yeah, you did really well. Um, so thank you. So I'd, I'd first of all, like to um, 
address my first question to Furkan. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously you're a founder of a business, a very experienced, um, very experienced background, rapidly growing um, business. I think it'd be really interesting for us all to hear more about your leadership style and how that's evolved over the years. I think it's still evolving. <laughs> um, I think you know, people keep asking you know, what leadership is. I don't know if I know the answer. But you know, in my own journey, I've gone from kind of being a player to becoming a player manager to becoming a manager. It's mm -hmm. probably utilizing yeah. football as an example. And I think just as a business is growing, and as when you're in founder mode, you do everything. You, you, you're the banker, you're the accountant, you're this, you're that, you're this. Uh, then you start hiring people in, and you know, if you're hiring right, you hire people that are better than you, um, and then they make your life a bit easier. So I think part of it is really understanding how, you know, my journey's evolved to picking the right people for the right tasks, uh, and then learning when to step back and let them shine, because um, I always want to shine. Um, <laughs> but you know, just on a series, it's giving them the opportunities, and it's really hard, I think, that transition, and it, it I don't, I don't know when it happened in our business, if I'm honest with you, but it happened quite naturally. Uh, but recognizing that you know you, you have to go from kind of founder to leader if you want to achieve growth. So I, I've experienced it all now from kind of two two friends at uni starting a business mm -hmm. together to hiring in people who are you know old enough to be my parents, um, having to manage them, paying them big salaries, um, raising money and sitting opposite investors in big London offices when you know, I don't have an MBA, and we're talking about discounted cash flows, I'm like, okay, YouTube. <laughs> what an absolute savior right, in our generation, YouTube is for learning. Um, but I think, I think for me, it's, it's an ever-evolving thing, but one that I think it's marginal things that make a difference, so there's nothing you do as a leader that makes you a leader, it's, it's the attitude and the culture that I'm learning to set that the team operate within mm. uh, to kind of give them the, the space they need to grow. Yeah. Fantastic, love that. And Paul, as a technology leader with many years experience in the industry. Because I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> what, what would you say your top three leadership principles are? Um, so I'd start by just being open and honest um, because you're, everyone's there, they know, they, they can see it, they can see it, they can feel it by your behaviours and everything else. So if you try and mask stuff, they just they then just lose faith and trust in, in what actually you're doing. Um, the other thing, that the next sort of thing is, um, it's a bit corny, but having a North Star, so having a, a direction, something that's not date bound, it's not fixed on something, but actually you can constantly be explaining the, the journey towards it, what steps you're taking, what effectively, how they can actually be going on that journey with you to actually achieve it. But the key to why it not, just can't be date is because effectively, if you miss a date, what happens? Is it the end of the world? Probably not if you're a day out. You know, there's, there's other things that matter about it. And then in terms of the, the final one, I kind of, I think it's just around having empathy because everyone's going through lots of different things and all, mm -hmm. and people are at different stages of their life, especially at the moment, mm -hmm. all the things that are going on in, in the world. Um, it's, you've, you've got to try and understand what's, what's actually impacting them and actually almost how to make each of them happy and where where they are and they're happy to scale on a weekly basis because yeah. that actually if, if the team's happy or the individuals are happy the team's happy the velocity or whatever phrases you use to do it the outcomes are just so much more yeah agreed love that mike you told us a little bit earlier about those that successful career you've had in tech but 30 years in tech leadership well, now <laughs> i just thought that'd be nice great. and polite <laughs> <laughs> a strong background in tech leadership what inspired your career and who I was, uh, yeah, because you, you told us what the question was going to be yeah. beforehand, which is very nice of you. Uh, no. You don't have to tell me. <laughs> no, that question was, uh, somebody asked me that um, about uh, two or three months ago, and it was amazing, people being hiring, um, will book a meeting with you, and you think, oh, that's quite interesting, that's great, and then ask you a bunch of hard questions, and one was this question, and I kind of said, oh no, that one, I've always thought, what would I say, and I, and I said, I don't know really. And then, of course, I went away and thought, that's terrible that I couldn't really answer that. But then I thought it's because it's, you know, it sounds a bit cheesy, but there's so many people. Yeah. And so I sort of wrote <laughs> some notes, which then wrote tons of people's names. And then I kind of went, well, actually, it's this piece about the first place I worked, mm. you know, which was for about eight or nine years. 
and the way. Where was that? Um, it was a place called Prescription Pricing Authority. Okay. Um, it's now called BSA. Mm -hmm. um, when I started, it was twenty. So I thought, is the answer not always six pound forty? Oh, the drugs bills are eighty billion, <laughs> and there's a lot of complicated data analytics. Really, is what it was. But you know, I kind of didn't know what Sitting that was. It. <laughs> Twenty one, and basically that that place, um, you know, they. It was kind of like a startup within the NHS. It was providing all these services to different parts of the NHS. And the person who set the office up just basically got an office really near a house mm -hmm. so she could walk to work, which was <laughs> brilliant. Um, and then hired a bunch of us as graduates and then some really kind of senior people who were 10, 15 years older than us mm. and just created these fantastic teams. And I thought that inspired me because there were consultants in the, you know, in the, in the real terms of 30 years ago, who were these genius people, and yeah. you just sat next to them, and they just taught you everything. Yeah. How you test stuff properly, how you design stuff, how you look at performance, all these things that just live with you in a tech career. And for me, that was, it was quite inspiring, because I had no idea really that it was going to be beyond, you know, writing some lines of code that you did at Newcastle Poly, which is where, <laughs> I, where I studied, you know? Um, and so that was this amazing sort of um, foundation, and watching how these people manage putting teams together. Mm -hmm. Some of the massive mistakes as well. You know, there was That's some, what you learn from now, isn't it? Yeah, the, you know, we kind of had a new head of tech who came in. And he was brilliant, genius in terms of the way we were going to build all this data-driven technology and transfer from mainframe technology to client server and web. But on his first day, he banned the, um, the tea break, which was a thing. In the morning and in the afternoon, that yeah. was banned. Um, Absolutely shocking, yeah, you know. Friends, <laughs> <I'm just laughs> yeah. And you know, this was done by Memo. <laughs> <laughs> so there were some really interesting things in it. Another one I remembered was a, you know, things that form you was a, oh, well, I'll get the ten best people in the department in a room and they can sort this out. And we were all sitting outside going, I wonder what they're talking about because we're not in the top ten. <laughs> so you know, there's just some things, that interestingly, kind of inspire you in sort of some sort of funny ways. Yeah, yeah and, and then I think when I moved from that business to a startup, there was about 30 of us, another sort of startup, but it was in a, a proper, you know, work for investment banking, globally started by two chaps who'd done that for a living. And um, that was this amazing apprenticeship in how you start something and how you run it, because you started as a, you know, as a developer or a project manager, but you were in this entrepreneurial thing. Yeah, right. And it was just you doing everything, you know, and that was, that was really fascinating. And they, they, they were really good at, you know, setting up the company, working with Wall Street. What do you think? Wow. We were all really terrified. Now going to be all brilliant at technology, and you find yeah. out they're kind of not, which is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so we had all these great opportunities, and they just basically let us build this company without a huge amount of interference. Oh, wow. We kind of got to make some money, yeah. and we've got to do good work. You know, a lot more to it than that. But that was a really fascinating thing about letting people just go and be self-directed and see how that works. And also in terms of if you hire the right people, that sort of magic that yeah, can it happen. Takes care of itself. So yeah, so that was brilliant. Um, and then you know, I think they did really inspire me because I saw how they did that, and they thought they were going to have about ten or twenty people in the business. Mm -hmm. and at the end, there was like eight hundred wow. all over the world. So it was quite inspiring seeing people thinking, "Oh, this is the horizon." And then just letting it go and letting other people do things. And they sort of let me do that really as a sort of, is that term intrapreneurial, yeah. where somebody lets you yeah. build a thing in the business? And somehow they let me build a kind of web technology business within the business. Oh, wow. Which was really an invaluable thing when it came to doing it yourself because it was a good idea. You go and do the marketing, you sell it, or you build a team. And I kind of, oh, I thought. You were just going to give me some work to do, <laughs> so that was that was fascinating as well. So, so I think you know that it's those things that in, inspired me really, um, and you know the current in the current company. Yeah, you, you have know, got some amazing people. Yeah, and that's brilliant. You know, I think that the comment you made about bringing in people better than you, yeah. and you totally learn that early, don't you? Yeah. And then you get inspired by those people, and you kind of get a nice sort of teamly. Set up and I, and, and I did the first thing I was going to say is, you know, should you say this? Your dad. Yeah. So my dad is an engineer yeah. and he was the person who came home one night and I remember him, I was like 14 or 15, going, bloody consultants. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I was 
hadn't thought about it. And he said, oh, well, these folks have come in. <laughs> and they're on the photocopier all the time. And he's an engineer. And he's going, what, what are they doing? You know? And so I sort of dug into this a little bit. And then he kind of said, well, you know, I know you want to be a graphic designer yeah. and a professional skateboarder, but here's the truth, right? <laughs> <laughs> here's a computer. And he bought me a computer. And you know, that was a, the rest is history. That was a, yeah, that's a thing, you know. So, yeah. It's nice to see how like each step along the way has helped mm. inspire you and where you're at to now, which is awesome. <laughs> Natasha, <laughs> as leaders, we often celebrate our team's success, but I think it's often important to kind of take a step back and take a moment and look at your own successes. What's yeah. the most recent sort of significant success that you've taken the time out to celebrate? That's such a good question. And also, by the way, I have notes. I've had like two, three years of having talks where I can just zoom in, have my notes on the screen and be like, yeah, <laughs> I'm so well prepared. Uh, so if I look at notes, I promise uh, it's because I want to do this justice. So uh, the last big milestone that I celebrated, I think, in my career was joining Amazon um, in 2020. Uh, it's a great achievement. So firstly, I'm a voracious film and TV watcher. I did a degree in film. And I love film and TV, and it pretty much um, shows in my career, right? I went to the BBC, onto Sky, and onto Prime Video. Uh, but I love technology as well, and so I get the best of both worlds. And um, it was such a sort of milestone for me one day to join a FANG. If you familiar with the term FANG? No? Uh, Facebook, Amazon, oh, yeah. Apple, Netflix, Google. Uh, but now because Facebook are now meta, I think it's like my <laughs> uh, So, But to work on a product like Prime Video genuinely motivates me every day. I'm an avid user of the product and so actually that's a huge motivation to get out of bed and work on uh, the product. Um, and I think that's just one of the silver linings of the pandemic. In a million years I didn't think I'd ever end up at a fan or a main. Um, <laughs> because I didn't want to move to London. I have two young children, I have a husband who's really settled here, so I thought that was completely off the table for me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Amazon are incredibly embracing of remote working, and I have, uh, I've been told to shout out about this because we are hiring virtually now. I'm, I live in Harrogate, mm -hmm. and I go into the office once a month. <laughs> and uh, so if any of you are looking or listening, uh, <laughs> check out the Prime Video Job Boards because there's a lot of remote uh, opportunities, and it's awesome. Um, but deconstructing it further, there's more call-outs I'm proud of. Uh, Prime Video is the first job where I've onboarded remotely. Mm -hmm. I onboarded remotely into a leadership team. My boss is based in Seattle. Uh, I have a team that are based in five different countries around the world. So I have a team in Seattle and uh, LA. I have a team in London or in the UK. I have a colleague in <coughs> India. I have a big team in Beijing and I have a growing team in Tokyo. And uh, so that was insane of how to adapt my leadership style mm -hmm. for remote working. I also have a huge challenge because not, I cannot meet my whole leadership team in one time zone. Uh, so I have to meet with my UK and Beijing Tokyo team and then try and bring my Seattle and my LA team back up to speed in the afternoon. And it's, we've oh. tried it once, uh, I think at 12 noon I think it's about 11 p.m. in one time zone, about 7 a.m., 6, 7 a.m. in the other, oh. and everybody was like, we're not doing this again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so with this communication continues to be a big challenge for us, and we were talking about this earlier, Amazon has an infamous writing culture. PowerPoint is banned in the business. We write, and we are voracious writers, and we believe in the clarity of thoughts and documenting things so that we can share documents very easily, we can annotate on documents, and it means that extroverts like me don't dominate the room, that introverts mm. get their time to comment, have their um, opinions heard and listened to in a way that suits them. Uh, and so prior to joining Amazon, as I kind of talked about in my 60 seconds, I was at uh, Sky, where I was one of the heads of technology at Sky, and prior to that I was at the BBC working on BBC Sport. So with the BBC, it's very UK focused, Sky was UK Europe, but this is the first time I've truly worked on a truly worldwide product. Uh, and you know, to give you a bit of background, what I do is my team uh, gets Prime Video into living room devices. So if you think about your devices at home, you may have a smart TV, 
You may have a video games device like a PlayStation or an Xbox, a streaming stick like Roku or Chromecast, or a set-top box like Sky or Virgin or Comcast. Um, my team gets Prime Video onto those devices. So it's incredibly challenging because we're trying to get the same technology onto a, a, a 1,000 pound TV and the same technology onto a 20 pound streaming stick. Uh, so it's a, a, an amazing Rubik's Cube of the challenge, so I work with all of the third party uh, manufacturers around the world, so Sky, uh, Samsung, uh, PlayStation, so everyone in that team is delighted to have a PS5 um, <laughs> for testing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I already asked you for all the tests. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we get to work on awesome things to really improve the customer experience. So uh, recently, for example, we uh, launched Filmmaker Mode uh, with LG as our pilot partner, which is this amazing new technology, it's uh, industry first, that uh, Filmmaker Mode enabled content will switch the audio and video on an LG enabled TV to how the director or the creator intended it. So you don't have to fiddle with your TV to audio and video settings, it will auto change it uh, to how um, 1917 was designed to look like. Uh, so we've worked with the uh, Hollywood Film Alliance, uh, wow. with um, all of the biggest directors, some new, you know, up and coming people like Martin Scorsese, um, Christopher <laughs> Nolan, um, on getting this out. And that's something my team helped deliver. And so that's pretty badass, right? It gets you out of bed in the morning. So Amazing milestone joining Amazon. Fantastic. Yeah, it's not the water, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Mike, I'd like to talk more about people and um, leading people and obviously seeing people grow and develop and, and flourish is a really an enriching experience. I think it'd be really interesting to hear more about how that's done at Opencast mm -hmm. and how you develop people, but more about career development within Opencast. Yeah, I mean, it's a, that's a, it's a great question, especially today, in terms of, you know, people trying to attract good people mm. and keep good people. Mm. Um, probably... Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, I, I thought about this one in terms of when a company really started to, to grow a few, a few years ago, beyond mm. sort of 60, 70 people, and a number of people said, so, you know, what about what happened in previous lives where especially in consulting where people are kind of plugged into particular clients and people can just end up doing the same job for a long time which some people yeah. kind of want to do mm. and other people who want to progress and it can be then limited by what the client will let you do yeah if i can say that but yeah, that's yeah. kind of what happens especially yeah, when true, people are really good at a job yeah you go oh well can you just keep on doing keep, that keep at that, that level yeah. so yeah. somebody asked me at one of our off-sites about well question about culture maintaining culture as well but about you know, careers, I said, like, it's something that we definitely in previous life didn't focus on enough um, because we were so busy growing the thing. Mm -hmm. I thought, if that starts happening to us, we're going to have to really be careful mm -hmm. and what, what should we do about it. Yeah. So, you know, you know, definitely one of the things that we've done is invested quite heavily in people who are L&D professionals mm -hmm. and, and grow teams and not just one person. The other classic is you have a person <laughs> and you give it all to them and they yeah. go, well, I can't actually get anything done. <laughs> so we learned that actually if you're making some money, a smart thing to do is to then invest in that properly. Um, so, we, you know, we've done a lot of that. Um, I have to say, you know, we've grown 200 people in lockdown or more. Fantastic which is great, um, and it, it's pushing on further, but then that, that challenge is, well, let's get the career frameworks in place, mm -hmm. and then six months goes past, and you go, oh, we haven't really given people a chance because everyone's focusing on recruitment. So, you know, just being completely honest, which I think we all are, mm -hmm. that's something that we're focusing a lot on at the moment and really hard on, and one of the things that we've done, we developed a, a really brilliant UCD function a few years ago, and what we said is what we'll do is point out at problems we've got yeah because you know we do believe in doing things for the you know the, the kind of end consumer as it mm. would be that the people who work for us or the client so let's sort of aim that and see what we can what we can discover that people really want so um that's been really interesting actually because yeah lo and behold guess what you think this is what people are going to want <laughs> people are completely different jobs um and the clients are doing different things so i guess 
you know, we're working really hard on that and we're trying to make it a real, you know, everyone's growing culture. So when we're hiring people, you know, it all comes down to who you actually hire and, and the, the reasons you hire them mm -hmm. around that. Look, we are about growing. We get that some people might have quite, so I call it wiggly careers. I mean, mine has been a bit yeah. like that really <laughs> where you think you're going to be working in this thing and suddenly that's really not the thing yeah. for you and it maybe it is a different client but maybe I've heard people got the career timing more and it's a good way of looking at it yeah um yeah i would have heard of people kate talked about that and i thought that was brilliant mm -hmm. because it was so visual and really did describe that yeah. thing where you work in software development and then you suddenly thinking you know what this management yeah. this might be good oh actually mm -hmm. What about account management, which is a totally different thing? And I think you know some people have made some really good moves in our company. And I've seen that in the past and sort of done it myself. And you find something that you didn't really think was going to be your thing. So we're kind of looking quite hard at, well, how do you make sure that's real? And you don't just say it, yeah. like you know, because you know how that goes as well. You say, oh, we're, we're like this, and then you're off on the day job. Um, so there's been a lot of that we've got to make these things work because the you know, the growth thing, and for a lot of people, just isn't stopping. Yeah, yeah. So it's tough for a consultancy to take a risk though as well, isn't it, when it's, when, it's, when you're charged up to it, and people are yeah, expecting yeah. Um, loads of experience already. I mean, that's the it's devil just, in consulting, yeah. that people have to be charged out, or it's, yeah. you're not making any money, so it's kind of making it so, yeah, everyone knows that, mm -hmm. but then how you can then work with a client, say, well, we kind of got to, we're looking after you, but we're looking after the folks as well, so you mm -hmm. can't, expect this much time all the time and mm -hmm. if you get the right clients and have the right relationship that works because they want to retain the people too yeah mm -hmm. so you know there's been a lot of partnership stuff which i think we've always been pretty good at doing but especially now where you know there's no magic answer to say where these people are going to come from or where these seniors are going to come from so you've got to bite the bullet and say well we've got to work on it together yeah definitely so yeah fascinating times you know at, at the moment and i mean yeah, I could talk about that for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, thanks but, for being really open and honest, because obviously there's there's still a lot. It sounds like there's still quite a lot to work on there, but you're moving in yeah, the right direction. Which is, which it's is exciting, right? Really it's, yeah, yeah, evolution and so on and so forth. Yeah. So I think that's you know it's a really interesting space. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So Paul, I understand that um, Atom Bank last year, back end of last year, mm -hmm. was um, rolled out the four day working week. Yep. Um, so it'd be really interesting to hear how that initiative went, how the pros and cons, and um, I understand there's quite a number of businesses that have tried, tested. It was the biggest company in the UK at the time, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah, biggest one at the time we've done it. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, we're 450 people. So. Yeah, wow. Yeah. How did that go? Well, how's it going? Because it's still going. Yeah. <laughs> I'm off tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which means I have jobs to do. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm off. I, have, I, mean, I, have, I have kids water. to go and do it all, and I have ironing I'll be in. <laughs> I've now become an ironing expert. Uh, so that's the main thing I've learned from a four day week. <laughs> um, but, so, four day a week is, frankly, it's really, really good. Uh, and it's, it's in, in many ways, it's a game changer just for me from a throughput perspective in terms of, we do one hour longer day, so we do an eight and a half hour day uh, for four days, and then we have a day off. But in reality, on, on the, you know, most people on a Friday afternoon probably weren't uh, having lots of meetings anyway, and mm. people start to go off. So actually, it, it's, it's kind of, you haven't lost anything, but you've gained a day off. And actually, what that does for you mentally, what it does for your family, what it does for, for you actually just in giving you space where you've got lots of pressure on you in terms of, of work at different times. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a game changer. But having said that, it's not for everybody. Um, so that's, there's, there's been certain people who've just opted out of it because really? they don't want to. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, because one size never fits anybody. Yeah. And, and so it sounds like most people go, oh yeah, I want, I want a four day week. Uh, but there are people, for very good reasons, who just, just don't. They, they want to be doing you know, the, a different, a different hours and everything else, and you've got to accept that. Otherwise, uh, you lose people that you don't, yeah. you don't yeah. want to lose, and anything like that. Uh, but in terms of the actual, the the makeup of it, we did have to put some loose controls around it in terms of ideally making a Monday or a Friday. Mm -hmm. So just because you you want people to be around, you've got to make certain you do it in a in a fair way to everybody. Because yeah. we're a bank, we're still open actually seven days a week. Yeah. So you've got to make certain that people aren't feeling like. Uh, if they're on the, the service desk or if they're in the ops, ops area that actually they're, they're still uh, being given the same sort of benefits and, and everything else. 
Uh, so, so there are other nuances uh, you know, which, which don't naturally always come out. But in terms of um, measurements, in terms of actually how we've gone, so we've been tracking it from across every department. So like in technology, we've been tracking like our uptime or response times. We've been tracking our throughputs in from change perspective. And they've either increased, as in got better, not in terms of... Um, <laughs> uh, or they've stayed the same, which, which, is, which is all, all cool. But in terms of actually employee engagement in technology, just by giving people the flexibility rather than, than actually saying you must yeah. and everything else, um, you've be basically gone off about 13% in wow. six months. Um, really so, so we've now got a, a, you know, an employee engagement score in the 80s, which is really, really good. That's so we weren't, we weren't bad to start with, but now mm -hmm, it's, yeah. but it's, it's about actually we've, given, we've empowered the people in, mm -hmm. in lots of ways to go and, go and deliver. Uh, and go and deliver in a way that works works for them, works for their families as well. You've got the metrics behind it, which is awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's so we still have fish on a trial, uh, but yeah, it, it's uh, it's not going back. You can tell from everything that's going on. Yeah. Uh, it's, there's just, uh, but it will. It, it's 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 got momentum and it's got it's got it's, it helps so much as well around uh, attrition. So <coughs> last last year, probably most people had a. A big vaccination type of thing, yeah. and sort of uh, mm -hmm. Augusty time and all that sort of stuff in the in the summer. So you know, in technology, we're about about 110, 120 people, um, and we've lost three since we started it. Wow. So, which, so just the difference is is amazing because even that uh, helps from a throughput. Uh, you know, in terms of actually people's delivery and people's because when people leave, it affects everyone's morale. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. not just yeah, about So you actually do want to keep the people, and you've invested in them anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's, 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 it's a true game changer. It's, it's, really, it's really good. That's it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> is there an option, just really quick question with that, is there an option for, since you said there's an extra day, an hour, <laughs> 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 extra hour a day yeah. for the four days, is there an option to do that on the fifth day and not do the official four day week? You, people can work five days if they so, want to, but but only do the four days on the fifth day, four hours even. They they can do thirty. I don't don't quite understand. They can do thirty four hours over five right. days if they want, which yeah, I yeah. think is what yeah. you're asking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, no. So we we aren't. There's no no arm yeah. if anyone's back no, to say you've got to do four. Of them. It, yeah. So some people may prefer that if they depending on what their circumstances are at yeah. home anyway. Yeah. And we haven't um, done it as, in terms of saying and now everyone must come into the office. So we're still yeah. offering a hybrid, remote, depends on you know, whatever works for, for areas, yeah. and that tends to be by team. Uh, mm -hmm. If one Teams tend to come in rather than individuals, yeah. and they tend to do that for, for themselves, and yeah. based around actual events. So, yeah. But it's also like cool, because you know, that whole flexibility model is amazing now. That, you know, I did compound hours uh, at Sky, so I did five days and four, yeah. when I was coming back from maternity leave to have more time with my child coming back. And you know now, I mean, with flexi working, um, you know, Amazon is allowed. You know, we're expected to kind of go into the office once a month. Obviously, people go in more regularly, but kind of the cadence is around once a month. But that flexibility is amazing because, it, as you say, it's about retention and retaining people in the workforce um, by giving that flexibility. But I think also as employers, you've got to realise that employees are probably looking for that flexibility too. So if you want to give yourself an edge against other companies and other candidates, you know, the flexibility you're willing to offer is probably going to be one of the reasons they choose you over somebody else. It's not even an edge anymore, is it? Like, yeah. obviously as a recruiter. People yeah. Times and they're like, oh, we let people work from home two days a week. And I'm like, well, that's really not going to be enough. <laughs> let me coach you around that piece. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, it's just expected, isn't it, in our industry? So. Natasha, Hello. you've always inspired me as a really strong advocate for women in tech over the years. Mm -hmm. And you've also founded Empowering Women in Tech, which is amazing. Um, an open platform for women in the industry to share knowledge and inspire others. I've been to plenty of your events in the past and really, really enjoyed them. If you haven't, definitely make sure you attend because they're incredible. <laughs> um, as tech leaders, I think we all want to learn more about what we can do to encourage more diverse representation into the industry. So I'm hoping you got the magic answer. Oh, <laughs> I'm sure this is an answer. answer. I have an answer whether it's magical. I don't know. Mm -hmm. You judge. So Elvis Presley once sung, "A little less conversation, a little more action, please." And I think there is a hell of a lot of conversation on this topic, and people go to these events and they feel so inspired and empowered afterwards, and then nothing changes. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think 
we need to look at it as diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think that actually the three terms are in there because you do need to look at it as a triple-pronged approach. I set up Empowering Women with Tech nearly six years ago to empower and educate more women and people from uh, different backgrounds to get into digital science and technology because, quite frankly, I love what I do. It's a cool job. It's so people orientated. It's exciting. It's fast paced. It's creative. Uh, I get to problem solve and work on things that I genuinely enjoy using. And I found it really weird that there wasn't more diversity in the industry because it's it's a cool industry. I I get to wear what I want. I uh, you know it's a cool lifestyle. You get paid well. You get to travel the world. I mean you know you go. You people are all in you know with me right. Um, and so with empowering women with tech, it was about setting up events that um, showed role models um, from you know, a vast spectrum of uh, backgrounds, show different career paths that it isn't just about coding, um, and to demystify the industry. We speak our own language. We talk about Ruby and Agile and smoke testing, and you know, people outside. It, it phases them because we talk our own language and we don't realize we're doing it. And it can feel um, uh, a scary industry to get into, because, but once you know the terms, don't you? It's easy to jigsaw this together. And so Empowering Women with Tech has been running, uh, we've had uh, three annual conferences, 21 events, 8,000 people have been to at least one of them. We have 137 people in the industry mentoring scheme. And I focused it predominantly on the north of England because nearly all of the tech events that were happening were in London. And so we're trying to make a change of movement that expect people to get on the train for two hours, 15, to go to a conference and pay a couple of hundred pounds for a ticket. And so I wanted leads to be at the stage. So I brought big speakers like Lauren Laverne, Dr. Sue Black, and Marie Ithamifidon, um, oh crikey, um, astronaut Helen Sharman to the city. Uh, the events were free to attend. We also offered bursaries for <coughs> transport and for babysitting or elder care sitting. Uh, we would offer pre-meets, so somebody who'd never been to an event before could go to a pre-meet and we could buddy them up with someone, because it's really daunting going to a networking event when you know nobody, um, uh, at least until you've had a drink. <laughs> uh, and, um, and so we have done a lot of talking on it, and this is why we have to pivot to being much more delivery driven obtain the results we need and, and why this aspiration is not being realized. Quite frankly, you are not going to hire an inclusive workforce if you're not short, shortlisting inclusive, you know, an inclusive shortlist. Mm. And right now in the industry, we are working at such a fast pace that we need to fill the role to yesterday. I have loads of um, jobs at Prime Video. Did I tell you I'm hiring? <laughs> um, and, um, and it, you know, it's easy to get seduced by the pace that you, you, you need to fill these roles. Yeah. But you have to have um, a moment of pause and get the right shortlist, because otherwise it's just self-fulfilling. You will not get diversity unless you shortlist. We need to provide equitable access to training, to events, um, to mentors, and for everybody to get into the industry. We have an industry skills shortage, mm. and you know, it, at a diverse level, but just full stop at uh, a skills level. Uh, I don't know if the statistics still ring true, but around 91% um, of people who sit A-level computing in the UK are boys. 91%. Mm -hmm. um, so that's already a, a, a harsh statistic. But also, I think it was something like 2,700 people sat at when the industry is saying like we need like 20, 30, 40,000 people leaving school with A-level computing. Wow. Um, so my biggest takeaway is to be results driven, to set company-wide goals of, uh, of around DE&I, and that the most senior people in your organization own those goals, and they are on the hook for it, and they are going to explain their work back plan of how they're going to get there. Yeah. Um, because otherwise we'll spend lots of money on these amazing you know, events, and we all leave really great afterwards, but we need change, and uh, it, it, these things matter. You know, right now, we're working on um, a lot of machine learning, there's huge amounts of evidence about algorithmic bias, and you know, if, 
month we don't get diversity in, there is huge problems that we will face because we are led so much by technology that we need to make sure that there is a, a right mix of people in the room asking the right questions from a diverse range of backgrounds. Um, because, you know, right now, so much is getting automated, which is great. Yeah. But with that, we have to make sure that we are going into eyes wide open. Mm. Thank you. Love that. Mike, how do you, I mean, cultures, it's mm. tough to manage and cultivate anyway, but across so many different locations and offices at Opencast Software, how do you sort of like nurture that company culture? And where everyone gets that sense of belonging and is aligned to the common goal and the vision of the business. How do you do that successfully? Yeah, I mean, as you know, it's such a big deal mm. for us. Um, it's for everyone now, which I, I mean, I am delighted about because I think there was a time, we, some of us have been in the industry quite a time, maybe people didn't really care mm. about culture. Yeah. I'm sure everyone says that they did, but I'm pretty sure that that wasn't a thing. It was can people do brilliant software development, <laughs> yeah. how they manage projects, here's a load of money. And then it was kind of a secondary concern whether anyone was sort of reasonably happy doing that and so on and so forth. So it's always been a really big deal for us. Um, and, you know, yes, how do you, how do you kind of transfer that? I just think it happens by osmosis, which is, I think, yeah. a problem that can, that can happen. And yeah. certainly I, I described before choosing previous life that was something somebody asked me how do you maintain the culture if in this offsite so we may we may grow to four or five hundred people so all right so this nice feel that we've got how do we keep that yeah so very much in the front of a lot of our minds where we remembered what happened when we thought it would just happen by osmosis mm -hmm. um so mm -hmm. we kind of did a lot of things about i won't say codifying it because i think that was a bit of a oh no that's a what a horrible thing that is to do yeah. with <laughs> culture, you know, you like program people or brainwash people. So we sort of work quite hard on, well, how do we, if people are going to join the business, how do we know what, what we're like? So we, uh, one of the first things we did is we made a, we made a little handbook and we sort of, we did pinch the idea from Valve. Oh, your playbook? Yeah. yeah um, I like it. And um, I have a prompt. <laughs> and it's here. <laughs> um, and it's. Uh, <laughs> oh, we're hiring. <laughs> we, we, we like giving these to people actually. Cause I think we're, I've got 50 yeah. of them with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, we kind of. What we started doing was saying, what are the things that we say as people in the business? Yeah. And you know, what are some kind of interesting quotes to use? You know, mm -hmm. everyone's got those. But which are really good ones that capture things? Um, and how do we really sort of get the, the voice of the company across? Because you know you'd start places sometimes and you get this massive pack. Yeah. And when I started in the consultancy, and I mean, I, it was just so dry and horrible. It's all just about rules. And you thought, well, so what's it like working here, you know? And that wasn't really set about in terms of induction. Yeah. So one of the things we did was made that, and that was way more successful than I think we thought it would be. And people had straight away dialed into what we were about, you know? Yeah. And, um, and the, we called it that because a, a dear friend of mine who I used to work with used to say that quite a lot. And yeah, he's definitely one of the people that inspired me, this chap called Andrew Billington. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he would say, don't step over the milk. And when he said <laughs> that to people, they would go, oh yeah, there's the thing. And how many people do that, right? <laughs> and so we had this real thing about when we're hiring people, that is a, that's a major thing, you know, to kind of capture what does that mean? So, you know, it can mean if somebody's in need of help at work, it can yeah. mean I've just spotted this heinous thing yeah. in production and we kind of need to fix that. Yeah. Or this thing's going to happen on the project mm -hmm. and it could be just, well, you know, slow my shoulders, I'm not going to touch that. And I think that was, a, that was a super core thing for us. So we, you know, we kind of set about spreading that word on induction. Mm -hmm. um, but then it also, you know, you mentioned the officers, well, in lockdown, we shut the London location and the Edinburgh location that were in shared office spaces. And so when we started coming out of this, the team said, look, you know, one of the things that we've now got is 300 people spread across the country because yeah. we widened out the, the, the recruitment remit. Um, because a great thing that happened in lockdown, when prior to that, our clients would quite often want people to work on site. Yeah. And we really didn't want them to because we wanted people to be more with our arms around them and. Mm -hmm. So we had to do a lot of stuff on culture when you've got people on 
site. Yeah. And that was sort of pretty You've challenging, right? It, you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's got all sorts of challenges. So yeah. the, the team said, look, what about if we then just pop up offices where we've got some concentration of people? I thought, well, that sounds like a really good idea. So it's, it was that way around, really, to do that, to then help have somewhere to come, people to come and do things. So it was sort of, you know, oh, you're not going to mandate people come in. So look, some useful things might be if you did this sort of meeting or that sort of meeting, but guess what, it's up to you guys. Yeah. So that's the way we did it really. And you know, we're seeing some brilliant things when teams are coming together and you feel that sort of you know, vibe in the office yeah. in, in Newcastle. So or, and, back, isn't it? Yeah, and it's, we just sort of set it up as a, look, if, we, if we've got a good location, we've got some good things there, that'll, we'll see where that goes. And that was definitely a way of helping with the culture. And then, I mean, as everyone's done, I'm sure, we've typically done co company conferences quite regularly, mm -hmm. hired people to do internal comms. So again, that's another thing that everyone gets hammered for yeah. on the surveys with people. <laughs> uh, the comms isn't, we don't know what's going on. Something and, so simple, isn't it? But yeah, it so, but it's, ha you need a lot of people mm -hmm. and people with good skills to make that work. So there's that. Um, also, you know, there's many kind of groups as we can set up for people to, you know, kind of agile development groups and functional programming groups, ECD groups, to go for a hike, play football. And I think that's, that's you know, that's that stuff, it's kind of obvious, mm -hmm. but it's just letting folks go and do that. And other things pop up, you know, a load of people said, we, rather than having a bit of a sort of, you know, we're, we're doing some work with charities, let's make that a group and then kind of take that to another level. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, great. So it's a lot of those things have helped. And I think just, you know, allowing people to go and do those things and giving people, you know, some proper budget to go and do it and not yeah, expect okay. that it's all just goodwill. And equally with time, you know, make sure you can carve off. Time is more important. Time than that's as well. Really yeah, and that's what's interesting about the, you know, the working days thing as well. And we've kind of said, well, look, what can we do in terms of freeing up days for yeah. people and hours? So, you know, a lot of that sort of stuff too. So, yeah. Fantastic. Faircam, um, at the start we talked about leadership styles and I know it's something that you're constant, continuously working on. I think it'd be interesting to understand what your most testing point in leadership has been over the years and how you overcame that. I want to know. I want to hear the worst story. So I've had some in, in my medical days yeah. uh, where you're completely out of your depth. So uh, I used to work at Papworth Hospital, which is one of the best places to ever work. I think the rule that Papworth was, people don't come to Papworth to die. So you make people live. <laughs> That's a great rule. And, you know, so <laughs> the, the, the mortality rate was really low. Yeah. And we were driven really hard. And it was all about the best results. Um, but as a lot was expected out of you, you know, as, as we went from junior doctors to more senior, mm -hmm. the junior doctors would come in under you, you ba barely know what you're doing yourself. Mm -hmm. Then you're in charge of this team and there's life and death stuff going on. Yeah. And, you know, for me it was very humbling. Uh, so when I look at business, yeah, I don't take much of what I do in my day job as seriously. Yeah. Um, I kid you not, there was a day where, and this is why I love nurses, like nurses have saved my life on many <laughs> occasions yeah. as a junior doctor walk in, oh, Mr. XYZ, heart rate's 10. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's got pacemaker. <coughs> Can you mess with it? Oh, yes. <laughs> and there was trial and error, and then we're learning this, and then we're having to kind of teach people, because you're moving so fast. So for me, I learned very early on that you have to have trusting environments yeah. where people can be honest about failure and lack of ability to say, look, I genuinely don't know how the hell a pacing wire coming out of a chest works. Um, could you teach me, junior member of staff who does it every day?
Having that empathy, creating that culture from the top down of having an open and authentic culture, I think, is really, really important. Yeah. Uh, but also, it's about retention, and we've talked about retention here a lot here. We can do all of the things to hire more people and get more people in, but if the culture is not right, and that you can't be authentic and honest and have uh, the, the right support mechanisms in work, mm. then you will have a leaky pipe. And so, for me, one of the biggest things that I've learned is really being authentic and honest about that, so it creates the culture. Thanks everyone for listening to our Let's Talk Leadership podcast, The Culture Edit. If you would like to talk all things thought leadership and how you've embedded a positive organisational culture, get in touch. You can also follow us on LinkedIn and stay tuned by subscribing to us on Spotify or YouTube for future episodes. Stay tuned for our next one. Bye for now, guys.